gather round me, children, I'll tell you the news. Don't worry about the names or dates, you already know it's true. The doctor hates your baby, the prime minister's a ghost. And all them folks are sailing here, cause they're in love with bows. Superfoods can save us from all our evil sin. JFK and Elvis own a bar in Wisconsin. Vaccinations were created by the CIA to steal votes from Bernie Sanders and turn your babies gay. So click the link you think you like and get tooled for a fight against those lefty fascist communists who are leaning too far right. Hi guys, so just before we get started, uh, just to let you know, you can get us on our social media at PGMcast on Twitter and Facebook. You can send us an email at info at notanotherfakenewscast.com or you can visit us on our website at www.notanotherfakenewscast.com. Um, if you like the show and if you want to support us, you can get us on patreon.com forward slash PGMcast. Now just before the show starts, I'd just like to say we recorded this on Zoom with Sir Jeff Palmer and... Uh, at times the sound is a bit clappy but it's very interesting so hang in there and i hope you enjoy the show hi and welcome to not another fake newscast i'm paul and i'm jerry and we are joined today by sir jeff palmer very pleased to be chatting uh with the man who was a uh, former professor of brewing and distillation um sir jeff was scotland's first black professor and was knighted for his services to science his charity and equal rights um, work in the UK. Most recently, Sir Jeff has been in the media speaking about slavery in the empire, specifically in relation to Scotland. Uh, so, Sir Jeff, welcome to the show. Thank you. As, as, as Sir Jeff, how we should address you as Jeff? Well, okay, it's, up, it's up to you. <laughs> I usually say it's, it's, it, you address me in the way in which I think will benefit your program. <laughs> <laughs> okay, fair enough. Fair enough. So, so, yeah, I mean, you you had a a very very interesting uh, kind of early life and upbringing yeah. the way that you came to the UK and and uh, mm-hmm. and and your sort of progression through the education system etc. Would you mind kind of giving us a, a little bit of a, a flavour of of how you how you ended up in the UK and and, okay. and and how that early life was for you? Well, I was born in Jamaica. Um, in, in, a, in a part of Jamaica called St. Elizabeth. And what is interesting is before I came to Scotland, it meant nothing, but I was born in Monroe, Monroe College District. Mm-hmm. And it's the Monroe, as you spell Monroe in Scotland. Um, and, and apparently that particular area in Kingston, it w- was obviously named after a Scottish um, a, a person. I, I should imagine he was in a sort of slave business. Yeah, and uh, he set up that particular area, and there's a very famous school there. But that didn't affect me much. I was just born there, and my mother and father then took me to Kingston, um, uh, uh, which is the capital. Yeah. And um, I spent all my time there until I was 14 years and 11 months when I left um, to come to the UK. When my life in in Kingston, as uh, you know, was pretty routine in a way because um uh, i spent you know my mom and dad we, we lived together for a bit and i think he, he left the family when i was about seven and right. he went to america and that wasn't unusual because a lot of the jamaican men were going off to america in a thing called farm working right. um, because there were not, not much work in jamaica so uh, and, and he sort of left and i never really saw him again until 1975 so I left when I was seven, and I didn't meet up again with him by accident in New York um, in 1975. So anyway, my mom left for London in 1951. So I would have been about 11. And she left me with her sisters. Um, and she had probably eight or nine, I'm not sure. <laughs> there were loads of them in the house. <laughs> and, and, and they looked after me, you know, very strong dominant women you know and um the, the the routine was school during the week church on sundays yeah and it's and it's three times on a sunday morning service sunday school and night service 
Um, and uh, th that was about it. And my, my school was next to the church. Um, and um, I stayed at that school until I was about, I don't know, 12. And then I went to another school in Kingston. But these were just ordinary, what we call secondary schools. Yeah. Um, so when my mother in 1955 sent my fear, and this is how we call it in Jamaica, you know, your mother sent your fear to come to Britain. Yeah. So my mother sent my fear to come to, to Britain in 1955. So I was 14 years and 11 months of, you know, about 10 months when I, I, I left. But it, it was about 14 years and 11 months. And she sent 86 pounds for me to come to the to meet her in London. And that 86 pounds is rather funny because she and I, until she died in 2003, whenever she wanted me to do anything, she always used to say, give me my 86 pound back. <laughs> <laughs> it was irredeemable. That <laughs> <laughs> at, least she wasn't, at least she wasn't calculating for inflation because that would have been substantially more. <laughs> A lot of money. No, no, I don't think. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't, I'm, I'm glad nobody told her that. <laughs> <laughs> um, but anyway, um, um, I, you know, the night I was leaving, my grand aunt, who we never knew anything about her, and she was almost as fair skinned as you, and she, she sat in the rocking chair, and it was her house, and 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 she was my mother's aunt. Right. And we, we, I, I, I still don't know a lot about her, but she called me over, took off my shirt, and uh, uh, and wrapped me in newspaper because she was going to keep me warm. Right. But she hadn't worked it out that the trip was eleven days. <laughs> but anyway, it it was a sense of looking after me, so yeah. I left, and I went to the airport. And I, 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 I got a plane, which I had not seen that close before. And I flew to, I think it's um, Miami. And in the, we had to get out the plane and they checked us out whether we were communists or not. I didn't know what a communist was, never heard of it. <laughs> um, and, but I just said what everybody else said, no. Um, <laughs> Well, that was that was the only we, test you had to pass. Are you a communist? Uh, no. uh, All right, how do you go there? That's fine. No, absolutely, because those <laughs> were the days of. But I think it's McCarthyism, McCarthyism, where yeah, yeah. everybody was being checked, and I, uh, and I then we I got back in the plane and flew to um, Florida to New York, and um, in New York, one of my mother, she had another sister or a cousin there. And they gave me an overcoat because I didn't have an overcoat because uh, it was March, yeah. you know, so it was a bit cool. So anyway, you know, that was now my first trip out of Jamaica, my first trip more than about, you know, 40 miles because that, you know, then Jamaica, I didn't go around much except for Sunday school picnics. You know, my education was fairly basic, um, you know, read and write and, and, and arithmetic. And um, but I played a lot of cricket, which played a significant part in my later life in London. So anyway, I I I, leave, I left New York and went to the boat stopped at Nova Scotia, and I thought I'd reached London <laughs> or Liverpool, um, but then somebody informed me I hadn't. I wasn't in Liverpool, so I got back on the boat. Um, and then it landed in Ireland. And it was rather interesting because a lot of people uh, there were coming on the boat, Irish people, and they were trying to sell us beads, you know, which I find it rather strange <laughs> that I heard stories of Africans selling beads in Africa, but I didn't know white people saw beads <laughs> as well or, or little trinkets. So anyway, it was rather nice. They were nice people. And I, I then left. Ireland, and then landed at Liverpool. That's where my destination was. I got to Liverpool, but I didn't know how to get to London. So I just asked around. I said, where is London? Could you tell me? And they said, get a train. And I got a train, and I arrived at Paddington. And my mother was there waiting for me, and she just said, come, boy, you're my son. Let's go. So we left, and I'd seen her since yeah. 1951. 
So again, there were no hugs. We didn't do that sort of things in those days, I tell my children. Mm -hmm. um, and she took me home to a place near Caledonian Road, near King's Cross, as we're in London, where she lived, in an attic. And um, uh, it was one room. She slept on one side, I slept on the other. And um, she gave me something to eat. I went to my bed, she woke me up the next morning. Um, and I thought it was early, you know, and uh, I said, where are we going? Why am I up getting up so early? And she says, you're going to work. And I thought, work, you know, in Jamaica, I never thought of work. Yeah. I mean, you know, you just go to school and then you, you go to church and then you fool around, but work. But anyway, she's my mother, so I got dressed, had something to eat. And we went down to the door to leave the house. And that's why I'm sitting here today, because uh, there was a man there. And, and the man said to my mother, you know, where are you going? And my mom said, we're going to work. And the guy said, you can go to work to my mother, but he can't. He's not 15. In those days, you left school at 15. So who, who was the, was this someone that your mother knew or was this someone who knew that you were not? I think it was the government. Yeah? <laughs> yeah, the government obviously knew all the kids who were arrived there in those days. Right. So I was lucky because probably six months later, a year, they just stopped that. Yeah. So I was fortunate that they, 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 they obviously monitored and knew every immigrant child that came in. I knew the age, so I wasn't 15, so somebody was there to check, you know, where I was the next day after I arrived. And he was there early. So if he'd come half an hour, 10 minutes later, yeah. we'd, we'd be going. So anyway, my mother protested. She's like that. She said, well, you know, famous, 86 pounds. <laughs> That's when it all started. <laughs> she gave him a long lecture, how long it took her to, to earn six pounds. <laughs> uh, but he said, no. And I always say this to my students and all the people I meet in my book who I've taught, you know, like whether they, they're brewers, like the brew dog guys, or wherever. I say, my, that man at the door said, I didn't make the rules. I remember him saying that. I don't make the rules. And the rules are that your son has got to go to school for a month. And she did let it relented and, and took me to a local school in London, comprehensive. But they were too posh, and they gave me a test and said I was educationally subnormal. Um, and, and, and then they sent me to a, a secondary mod school. Uh, that's what they were called there. And mm -hmm. the headmaster took me. But he took me with one condition. Again, it's this luck, as I say, which played such an important part in my life, that my mother takes me now to the secondary modern school, with a note saying I was ESN, and the head, the head must be the head teacher, Mr. Bullen, I can't remember his name. He actually said to my mother, well, I can't take him for a month. He'll ruin my register. Uh, he wanted all those herring bones to fill up one line. <laughs> if he took me, it'd only be, you know, like 10% of the line. He wanted the line full, and the line would be full by June. Right. But again, it's almost a spurious sort of thing to happen, but it, it is important because it is that that changed my life. Yeah. You know, he, he sort of said, I've got to stay till June. Now, had he not said that, I would have left in April, my birthday, 9th yeah. of April. Um, it's, it's very persistent, this guy. That's okay. <laughs> He's trying to... You can still, we're not recording. I can still speak. You're not recording. Yeah. Okay. We're not, we're, we're not recording, we're we're not recording video. We're only recording audio. So if you keep oh, talking. Audio. Okay, then I didn't realize that. Um, okay. So, we're not pretty uh, enough for listen. TV, so Jeff. Okay, right. <laughs> no, I thought I was on some. But anyway, um, the, the head teacher, um, Mr. Bullen, he said, I will take you for six months. That's, that's the bottom line. Yeah. And my mom then gave in. So he took me for six months, Mr. Bullen, and um, the change, significant change came when one day I was playing cricket in the playground and um, uh, the, the games master saw me playing cricket 
And he watched me for a while. And he came up to me and he said, you played a lot of cricket before. And I said, yeah, in Jamaica, I played a lot. Yeah. And he said, okay, could you meet me in the evening here? And I did. And he took me to a place called Gans Hill. And um, I went and there were lots of boys, cricket bats, and their dads, big cars. And I didn't know why I was being taken into this place. But nevertheless, they eventually told me to bowl. And right. I bowled. And then they eventually told me to bat. And I batted. And then I, we left. And the next morning, the, the, the games master came to my class and called me out. And he said, you're playing for London. Because <laughs> that was a trial. <laughs> that was a trial for London. <laughs> the, the London School Boys cricket team, which is an elite cricket team for grammar school boys. So I probably must have been the first, second modern school boy to play for the London School Boys team. And I, I, I played during the summer and the fixtures were rather interesting because my mom said to me, where did you go today? And I said, I went to a place, you know, it was big, lots of nets. The boys were wearing straw hats, so a little bit sorry for them. And then they had 20 of them in a room. And, you know, we only are living two to a room. And you know that other people, you know, black people, we only live three or four to a room. But there were 20 of them, I said, to her, in a room with these little beds, you know. And he had a straw hat. So I couldn't figure out where it was. It was later on. <laughs> I'm describing this to somebody, and they did point out it was eaten. <laughs> <laughs> well, those poor boys. <laughs> That's what I was going to say. I love the idea of looking at it like those poor boys. It was, all shared it was, it was, those straw hats. <laughs> you know, honestly, only in Jamaica, people wore straw hats. So I'm thinking, you know, they must be pretty poor. But I remember the conversation I had with him because, he, you know, he said, what does your daddy do? And, and I said, um, my daddy is, is, is in New York, and I think he does like, you know, the numbers thing. And he said, so does my daddy, he works in the city. <laughs> and, you know, so I had this lovely little conversation. I, I felt terrible that we beat them. But that was the London School Boys cricket team, and the fixtures were Eaton, Harrow, Winchester, and Middlesex Colts. And it appeared in the Islington Gazette. And the local grammar school headmaster saw a picture of me in the Islington Gazette and he rang my school and asked the headmaster, he told the headmaster he wants me transferred to Highbury <laughs> County Grammar School. Because he needed, that good he needed a cricketer. <laughs> he needed a cricketer, that's right. So I was, I had to go for a, a chat with Mr. King at Highbury, famous man, you know, headmaster, you know. Um, went to Cambridge, but wanted to teach in, a, in the inner city, as what I found out later, which was quite right then. Um, and uh, he, he, he sort of convinced me and my mother that I should go to Ivory. And, and he gave her five pounds because that's what the uniform was going to cost um, for a year. So anyway, that's how I got to grammar school. And um, I went to Highbury. It was difficult because they were doing all levels and A-levels. And I had not done much formal education like that before. Yeah. You know, I do reading, reading, writing, and arithmetic and singing. So that's my into the grammar school. So do, do you want me to go on from there? Or? No, I mean, uh, so I understand, I understand from uh, the little bit of kind of listening and reading that I've, I've been mm -hmm. doing on you for the past few days that you I think you you left grammar school and got a job right. as a lab assistant is that correct that's right yes i i became a i left in 1958 so i went there in 55 and i did my bit at the grammar school play cricket and and i liked biology yeah you know and the ballet teacher wasn't bad i didn't like the maths teacher because he thought jamaica was in africa <laughs> 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 I don't know whether it was joking. It was, a, it was a math teacher, not a geography teacher. Oh, yeah, it's a math teacher. So, <laughs> um, he used to say, boy, where did you come from? And I say, Jamaica. So it must be very hot in Africa. It's so here. But that was 1955, so anything didn't yeah. really matter. But anyway, I left in 58. And I had probably 
you know, three O levels or something. So I didn't do too badly from 55 to 58, you know, um, and I had biology in, I think I took biology A levels. I don't, I, I passed it, but I don't think I did all that well, if I can yeah. remember. Well, anyway, I went to Queen Elizabeth's College. That's where the job was. Yeah. In, and that was a part of London University in Kensington. And the interview was wonderful because, again, it's an important part of my life where Professor Chapman, he walked in, I was sitting in a room, and he just said, what's your name, boy? And I said, um, Godfrey Henry Oliver Palmer. And he said, I haven't got a lot of time. He says, can I call you Jeff? <laughs> <laughs> and you can have the job. And I said, yeah, of course. And that's how I start calling myself Jeff. My name isn't Jeff. <laughs> a lot of people have no idea that my name isn't Jeff. When I get an official letter from the tax or the government or anywhere, it's Godfrey. <laughs> um, so, if, it wasn't, if it wasn't for meeting that man, yeah, then... You, yeah, it's Professor Chapman. If I didn't meet him. But I wouldn't get the job and I wouldn't be here sitting in front of you either because so all these people, and I say to people, you know that, I was lucky, but life should be dependent on luck. Yeah. But I was. Um, and so Chapman, I worked there for a bit. And I was coming late to work because I lived in North London and this was in Kensington. You know, I was not in your gate. So I had to take the tube and it was a long time. And furthermore, man, we were having trouble with the landlord. He was chucking us out. And I had to read up all the papers in the in the library to figure out how we could fight the case because he was going to take us to, to court to get us out. And my mom didn't understand that. She, she did the praying and I did the reading. And, um, you know, we had to go to the, the... So I did a lot of that, and Chapman was aware of that. Um, he never said much, but, you know, but we, we won the case because I read that. I know the difference between a furnished and an unfurnished tenant, and that was a significant aspect there. In, yeah. in keeping your accommodation. Well, anyway, one day he just called me in his office. He, he, he walked past and I was messing around in, 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 the, in the lab or somewhere. And he said, could you come to my office? And I said, yeah. And he said, somehow I don't think you're stupid. You know, he said, I don't. And I want you out of this building to go to university uh, by 1961. That was 58, 59. Right. And I said, okay, you know, because I wanted the, the, the half day off, which he was going to give me. Um, so I took a half day off and I went to a polytechnic. Yeah. And I went to night classes. And um, I took the exams, all the A-levels and O-levels, which I needed, and I got them by 1961. Yeah. But I applied to a lot of British universities and none of them would take because I wasn't an overseas student. Right. They, I was, you know, a black guy from London, um, from an address in London, so it, it didn't fit in with the, the, the routine of the overseas student applying. Right. So I didn't get very far. And the, 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 the September, because the, the term starts October, and I remember Chapman stopping me one day, and he says, which university are you going to? Because he knew I'd got the A-levels. And I said, well, rather cheerfully, I said, I'm not going anywhere because I didn't get in. Yeah. Um, I didn't get an offer. And he said, go and stand at my door. And he went in his room and he said, I, um, don't move until I come out. And then he came out in about 15 minutes. And he said, you're going to Leicester University. So, so you had a good man uh, fighting your corner then. Very the nice that's right. Absolutely, because in those days, I didn't have the capacity. I didn't know anybody who did. Um, and uh, uh, so I just packed my bags and I went to Leicester. And I filled up my application form when I arrived. And I was <laughs> going to do honours botany. So I did honours botany there for three years. And I got an honours degree. I got two, two. And I left and went back to North London where my mom was. And, and I figured I got to get a job. So I went to the labor exchange, that's what they call it. Now. And I was offered two jobs, you know, with an honors degree. When I got in, the guy said, what can you do? 
And I said, I've got a degree. And he turned to his mate and he said, yeah, John, he says, this guy says he's got a degree. I think he's got a temperature. <laughs> he didn't believe you. And his friend was off. Well, again, yeah, because this was North London, 19, uh, uh, you know, what is this North London, what, 1964. I went in, is 61 to university. I was out in 64. So yeah. this is 1964, North London, Labour Exchange. The guy was laughing, thinking, I've got a degree when he think I could. Yeah. And again, this is all part of this sort of um, a society which um, is, you know, is based on a perception of black people, which is laid down, yeah. you know, um, by people like Kant and Hume. You know, that, that's how that drove slavery, in a yeah. sense that you could enslave them because, you know, they're not very bright and they can take the sun. Yeah, they're but in some way less so. Yeah, that's right. And, and that's, that's absolutely critical now. People are just beginning to notice it with the death of, of George Floyd um, because it was like a crucifixion where he's on, the guy's on his throat because he thinks he's... You know, is what he deserves killing because he's not used for anything else, and he's with his hands in his pocket. It, yeah. That is the thing that was important. It was his hands in his pocket, and therefore, at the labor exchange, it was a similar sort of thing. It was an indifference. So they gave me two jobs. One's a betting shop, work in a betting shop. I don't know what honest agreed boss they got to do with that, but uh, it's a betting shop. And the other one was peeling potatoes. Um, in Beale's restaurant, which was then in in Max Ed, in in in, in London. The and thing is, when when you've said you you've said that a lot of a luck has played a big part in a lot of things that's happened oh, yes. in your life. But if you take if you take your like the the, the path that you had travelled to get there, the amount of people who would have been in the the same situation but fell through the cracks because they didn't get mm. certain luck, do you know what I mean? They didn't have the right person fighting the corner to get them a university. They didn't have, like, maybe their mother couldn't save up quite as quickly and stuff like, you know what I mean? They didn't have that guy at the right time. They weren't particularly, like, I mean, you, you kind of understated a bit. You were obviously quite good at cricket, but um, you weren't quite good at cricket, so being able to get into that situation. So the idea that, there, there's a very real scenario that, that that there's an entire generation there that just fell through the cracks because people had these preconceived uh, opinions of the black community and of people coming over from say Jamaica and the likes. Yeah. Oh yeah. I think I think the the the, the thing is that I'm saying that it was luck. I, I, I the fact is I had the ability. You, you still had to get. You still had to get. Yeah, your, yeah, you yeah, yeah, yeah. Still had to get your yeah, levels, levels. You know. It's 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 the it's the, the I. The point is that it, the, the, the story here is that I'd be the same person without those people. Yeah. yeah um, in, in, a sense, yeah. In, in a sense that um, I would have the same abilities and the same potential. And this is what is, is wrong for a lot of kids, that yeah. without those, these people, I wouldn't be here. The point is that um, I, I would have, a lot of kids have got my ability. And, and this is what I said at the beginning. Somebody's life shouldn't be dependent on luck. I should be no. able to through the system, you know, like like other people who've got parents. You do the A levels, you do the O levels, and therefore you don't need anybody. Yeah, you see what but, I mean. Other than your parents, there are a lot of people in this country who are still labouring under the apprehension that we live in a meritocracy. When there's a lot of evidence that that really isn't the case, we, yeah. you know, if, if you look at the statistics for people um, from a poor social economic background, from people mm -hmm. who are from ethnic minorities, the this, this statistics for them progressing into further education and well-paid jobs are far less mm -hmm. than for people who come from middle-class families or you know, or, or from families with a lot of money and who are able to put them through private school, etc. You know, mm -hmm. it's yeah, again, you know, you can't really blame the children in that situation. You know, if, if mm. you're born if you're born into wealth, then that's that's yeah. not you didn't choose you didn't choose that if they're still applying themselves and they're still doing well their life and fair play to them. Mm. But there's so many more children out there who are quite 
with, with this high with a higher standard of education could achieve and they just aren't getting the opportunities to do it right i often say you know we, we need to educate every child because that child may be the one who discovers the cure for cancer yeah you don't know well, that, that's uh, that. I mean, there's, there's, there's boys there's, there's boys and girls and schemes across the whole of the uk right now yeah. who only don't know their calling is in botany or only don't know their call, uh, calling is in being a physician because the very concept of everyone, the idea that anyone around them could achieve that level is just something that seems so unattainable to them. Like, and, and But their entire social structure around them also believe the same thing, like you will never amount to anything because you come from bad stock essentially do you know what I mean like the, the, that's the mindset that's in lots of community uh, and it's but like like I said it's a, it becomes a very dangerous situation because it then means that you like you said you then that guy who was going to cure cancer or that woman that was going to cure cancer mm-hmm. never does because they've not been educated absolutely and it applies not only within our country but outside yeah and that's why I push you know for education and, and when I tell my story I'm saying you know, you know, I shouldn't need that luck, but it, I, but I had it, and, yeah. and, and but I'm saying that other kids should be able to do exactly what I've achieved without it, but but it's not possible. This is like a, a fairy story in terms of the people I've met, but I still had to have the ability to take the opportunities when they came, you know, um, and I've, I've sort of the humility that once I had a degree, and I was given the two, the two jobs, I could have said, I don't want those, I've got a degree. I could have yeah. objected to the professor calling me Jeff. And, you yeah. know, if you did that today, a lot of people go bonkers, you know, and everybody would tell them, you know, you, you can't do that, you know, it's, it's, you know it's, 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 it's totally unacceptable for somebody to do that. But you see, I accepted that because it wasn't a big deal to me. That's what some yeah. people have said to me, you know, um, it's not a big deal if I'm more concerned about somebody chucking my mother out of the house. Somebody calling me Jeff's irrelevant. Yeah, that's not as really, <laughs> in the large scheme of things, it's really not that important. And, no, you know, and, he, and he got me into university. He was a nice guy, never did me any harm. Yeah. But the, the point is now you're at work, and, and, and now I'm within the system. But so I've got qualifications, and the guys gave me two jobs one to peel potatoes. I went to work in a betting shop and I took the potato one because I knew my, my friend was working in a betting shop anyway. <laughs> um, and I didn't want to go in there. Um, so I went and peeled the potatoes at Peel's, a very famous restaurant there in London. So and I how peeled did, potatoes. How, how, did you get, how did you get from yeah. there to, to <laughs> eventually doing your, your PhD then? Okay, again, I worked from June till about December. 64 and I I saw an advert and this is the famous interview where you probably heard it on but it is when I went to this interview with this very famous politician and in in December 1964 and it it was a it was an MSc at Nottingham University and the interview was at Reading Right. And this famous politician who was so well known, you know, I won't call his name because he gave me I got he gave me so much trouble <laughs> in 2015. This happened in 64. So who and, I, I don't actually I'm not aware of this story. So are you <laughs> are you not prepared to tell us who the politician Well, was? I'll tell you the story and then I'll tell you who it was. If you listen to Life Scientific, it's on there. <laughs> right, okay. But I'll mention it anyway. Okay. Um and what happened was I um I, I arrived at this place for the interview and there is a, a a table of guys and this guy was sitting to the right of the I remember it just think the right of this the guy in the center yeah. and as soon as I walk in I'm told to sit down and I'm sitting like I'm sitting here and 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 and, and before anybody spoke this guy said why don't you go back to where you came from and grow bananas wow. <laughs> and I said it's difficult to grow bananas in Haringey. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so, I bet he didn't like that very much. No, he didn't. So <laughs> I didn't. 
I, I think it was Sakis Joseph, who was probably the second most powerful politician in the country at the That's time. Uh, and, you know, it's, it's no big, big deal because, you know, I've said that in loads of interviews up until 2015, yeah. when um, I did the live scientific for the BBC. And I mentioned it in there. Yeah. And then I, I got this, uh, you know, the, 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 the spectator made it a, a, an issue. <laughs> and, um, and, and it ended with, you know, it, it's just rather interesting because they were trying to get me to say it wasn't so key. Um, why? And, you, I mean, what, what, what's... What, why? I don't know. Who, who, are, they, who are they to query... You know, when I was what there, happened yeah. to you? Yeah, you were there. And why, why, why does it bother them so much as well, you know? Yeah, but it's all in the... If you check back with The Spectator or with even the Scott, I think the Herald had, had published a bit about it. Right. But, you know, it was resolved. It was resolved. And the BBC, you know, um, they, they, they had an investigation. <laughs> yeah. um, you know, but the, the point is that I've not withdrawn anything. Because it was true, yeah, and that was the end of that. But this is the sort of thing I've been through, which is a lot of people now in the articles I've just written. You know, uh, I did something in the Mail, and I did something in the Express, and I did something in the National, yeah. and I've written about all those early times. And the the interesting thing is that I now remember some of the stories, and they the people are some people are horrified, you know, where. The boy stopped me and said I should, you know, tell them the time. And of course, I knew what that meant. So I looked up at the sun and said it was four o'clock. And they were absolutely astonished. They said, how, how do you do that, mate? You know? And the point is that they didn't know there was a clock in the distance, which I could see. <laughs> so again, they were absolutely devastated because they think it could be done. Yeah. And I've shown them it can be done. Now, you, you're dealing with um, centuries of, of culture transferred where people believe you are, um, you know, you're second rate and you can't do certain things. And a lot of schools, a lot of politicians who I've spoken to and stuff believe, you know, um, this is an adult thing. But in Inverness, I went to give a talk to a school once and I said, who's ever heard of the nigger word and, um, you know, or the N-word, some people call it. And, um, they, you know, 90% of the class put their hands up and they were like probably, what, seven, eight? Yeah. So the point is that culture is transferred early. Prejudices are um, yeah. what we think of other people, um, um, negative or positive. And, and therefore, um, when that happened to me, I, I, I've got a, and I say this to, to a lot of people, I've got a tough sense of belonging, you know, with my aunts bringing me up and living in London um, and, and, and knowing a little bit about my history there, not a lot. Yeah. And I say to kids, you know, what the racists go for is your sense of belonging. And therefore, when that happened, although I didn't know as much as I do now, I was quite tough in that sense that I wasn't going to let it go. Yeah. So I, I then responded and I didn't get, of course, I didn't get the position. Yeah. Um, and, and I went back to the restaurant and then I saw another advert. I was dead lucky. I saw another advert um, uh, and that was for uh, um, Edinburgh, for the Harriet Watt. It was a, 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 a Dr. McLeod, Professor Anna McLeod later on. Um, she had an advert for a PhD. So I applied. I'd never come this far north. But when I told my some of my white London friends, you know, school friends, and I say to one of them, who's still my friend, I said to him, e -e -e -e, you know, I'm going up north, you know, and he said, well, where are you going? I said, I'm going to Scotland, I think. And he said, Scotland, he said. Is it in the north? And I said, yeah, it's in the north. He says, I live in the north. <laughs> <laughs> He lived in Finchley. <laughs> no, he... So, you know, there was this idea that, you know, the North 
is um, a, a place where um, you know, you know, sort of cows live, <laughs> and that was at the second in London. So anyway, still, um, still, still a part of that in London at the present moment. There's still very much like the idea that anything above, say, Northampton is just like. Farmland, you know what I mean? <laughs> that's <laughs> what he said. Oh, but that's my friend. He used to say, No, he says, He says, In the nose, they no nose, he says, only cows out there. <laughs> <laughs> but, so I, 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 I saw the advert for Edinburgh, yeah, and I applied and I got an interview. And I came up to Edinburgh and I was being interviewed by this wonderful woman. Anna McLeod, she's very well known. She, she's the only first woman president of the Royal Society in, in Edinburgh. Right. You know, when there were no women around to, to be to anywhere near, you know. Yeah. So she, you in, she's a great, great woman. So she um, uh, interviewed me and, 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 you know, we were very close until she died, you know, a, a few years ago. But um, the interview went as follows. And Anna, you know, she wore tweed. And she smokes senior service. <laughs> and she said, anybody who smokes cigarettes with tips are whips. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> she was really a tough, character. Yeah. A character. And, and so when I arrived, it was like, what, nine o'clock in the morning, and she was smoking senior service. She had a packet of 50 um, <laughs> on her desk. And, and 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 I sat in front of her, you know, and I'm thinking, oh, what's this? You know, was it sure. <laughs> and she had her hair was, you know, very old fashioned, and and she said, no, she said, young man, um, I want you to do a PhD, and you're going to do this on on barley, and I've never heard of barley. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, in, in the degree I did at Leicester, barley was a man-made crop, and yeah. thus it wasn't sophisticated enough for an honours degree in botany. And yeah. that was one of the silly divisions, that we weren't doing sophisticated research on, on man-made crops like barley and wheat. Yeah. You know, we were, we, my, my course was about a wild grass growing in Brazil. You know? Yeah. <laughs> what, what, so, use, it, what use is that practically to anybody? Absolutely. But a lot of universities, um, you know, if you're doing an honours degree in botany, and to me, this was a great change because now she wanted me to work on barley, which I didn't know anything about. So, and 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 the interview, you know, she told me all about barley in Scotland and 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 and, and the brewing industry and the distilling industry, and I didn't know a lot about those things then. And and then I think it about ten minutes into the interview, she stopped, and it's all classic, you know, one of my stories because she said um, she looked at me and she said. I'm going to take you. And I said, thinking, you know, and I said, why? <laughs> because I knew I was <laughs> doing very well. <laughs> I was doing very well and I didn't understand what barley was or, <laughs> or the brewing dis in industry and the distilling industry. You know, in England, they had the, uh, they, you know, there wasn't much about whiskey where yeah. I come from in, that, in the poor areas. So anyway, she said, I'll take you. Got to get this over, she said. I'm going to take you. And I said, why? And she said, for two reasons. And I said, well, what, 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 what are they? And she said, well, when I was telling you about the industry and, and stuff, you were looking out the window. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, what's good about that? <laughs> and, she said, and I swear... But even before she died, we often talk about it. He said, Jeffrey, I didn't say that. But anyway, uh, you know, I was, she said, uh, when I was telling you about the industry and, and all the serious things about the industry, you were looking out the window. And as I said, well, what good about that? And she said, you won't bother me. I hate keen people. <laughs> 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 and that's Anna. You know, she was, she's from Isle of Lewis. Oh, in the right. north, the McLeods of McLeods, you know, so she had a yeah, yeah. very powerful character and, and she knew what she was doing. She didn't, she told me that, but she had a reason, not a reason like that, but she wouldn't tell you. And anyway, I said to her, what's the second reason? I swear, because the, the political climate, correctness climate changed so much from 64. Yeah. So she just said, 
looked me straight across her desk and she said, as far as I can discern, you don't look English. <laughs> I mean... It wasn't racial. No, no. Yeah. It was... It was... It was like xenophobia. Yeah, yeah, it was... Oh, like, it, was uh, it was nationalistic. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know... Yeah, you, you, I don't, you doesn't matter if you're white or black as long as you're not English. That's, that's the way she saw it. <clears throat> so there was this, and that was what the prejudice was like then. Yeah. But Anna was just making a bit of fun of it. Yeah. Um, and, and, I, and I fully understand that. But what she really did, she had checked my background. I knew she had. Right. She checked when I came, what I did, where I lived. She rang up Professor Chapman. And therefore, she'd made up her mind she was going to probably take me before the interview. Before, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're sure, yeah. You, you got the interview on the grounds that you were the person you know, she, they, they gave in the interview to, do you know what I mean? Like, she, she, she was... The, the, in, yeah, and, and, and we, she, and typical Anna, she just gave me a bin of barley. Now, this is stories from some people that I've, I've never written about them because, you know, you think, whatever. But Anna, when I, she took me, and I started in 1965, my PhD at Harriet Watt. Um, so my PhD, although I work at Harriet Watt, is Edinburgh University PhD. Because mm -hmm. Harriet Watt was a college. Right. And they couldn't do PhDs. So technically, I'm, uh, and Edinburgh has now realized that I'm an Edinburgh graduate. So <laughs> all the publicity, they're oh, yeah. using. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. They're taking, they're they're taking that. Great. Both hands. Yeah. But <laughs> I did did the research at the Harriet Watt. And my supervisor at Edinburgh was Sadman House and Anna McLeod at, at the Harriet Watt. And Anna gave me a bin of barley. And that's how all my research started. A bin of barley. She's, and I said to her, what am I supposed to do? And she said, do what you want. <laughs> <laughs> so Just don't what? bother me. But little, that's little right, did, don't bother but, me. That's <laughs> <laughs> Little did she know, though, that the do what you want was going to be fundamentally revolutionise the brewing industry. Like, that's right. Which is, that's which, is, uh, which she was probably not what she was expecting you to do when she said, do what you want to be in all fairness. Well, yeah, I mean, yeah. So, so this this next step of your of, of your career kind of defined you in a sense. Like, you know, you won, you won uh, many prestigious awards for this. You... You yep. saved the brewing industry in the UK millions. So, mm -hmm. did you want to tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, well, what happened, you know, and, and it's a good story for kids because what happened, she gave me the barley, bit of barley, and I'm thinking, hell, you know, I'm in trouble. So, I, I then went to the Botanic Gardens. I was living near there in Edinburgh, and I went to the Botanic Gardens Library, and I just sat in the library for. for for months, probably about two two months. And of course, I did come in the lab. And the next thing I get a letter from Anna saying, where are you? <laughs> are you still doing the PhD? But I was in the library just about every day, reading, 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 looking at, and, and, the, and, and the, the approach is, was critical. A lot of people say, how do you do it? But when you don't know something about something, the only way to solve that is to go and read and read backwards and go backwards until you come to the earliest paper or information about your subject. And then you work back and then you look at the concepts and see which ones don't make sense because then you focus on that. And that's exactly what I did. I read back on Barley until I went back to 1890, a classical paper by a man called Harris Brown, who was very big in the brewing industry then as a scientist. And I noticed that he said the grain worked in one way, you know, the germ did it all. And there was a paper by a German guy, and he said, no, the germ didn't do it all. But that paper, nobody took any notice of it because of the importance of the English researcher. Yeah. And, and I decided to look and see what the German guy was saying. And at the end of the day, what, what I did was that I started the research, checking out the differences between these two concepts. And by 
60, so 65 by 67, we published the first paper in Nature. So my first paper was in Nature, looking at the, pointing out that I don't think what this guy Brown, you know, which everybody believed it was the icon of British grain research and brewing research. And I just said, I don't think the enzymes come, they, they come from the germ. And all over the world, that's what everybody believed. Yeah. And I said, they, they came from, the enzymes came from the bran, which goes around the grain. Yeah. You know, the, the, the wheat bran for, for breakfast. So I'm saying that the bran is the functional driving tissue of the grain in terms of enzymes. Yeah. Now, and it's that simple because I worked that out. <clears throat> and that was the basis of my PhD. However, Anna then got me a job or got me to apply for a job at the Brewing Research in, in, in Foundation in Surrey. This was a place owned by every brewer in Britain. They yeah. contributed some of their profits. So, you know, Guinness would pay more than Belhaven. Um, or tenants would pay more than, you know, a small brewery somewhere. But they would so, all benefit from the research. They all done. benefit from the research. Now, that's where I went to. It's near Reading, called Nutfield Ridge. Right. And when I, when I got there, you know, it was in the country. Um, I didn't know anything about Reading or whatever. But anyway, I got there and it was a stately home. But it was the research center of the brewing industry, and it was private. It wasn't government funded. Yeah. And all of us there had to do research on brewing raw materials. So some were working on hops, some were working on water, some were working, uh, like me, on barley and malt. Yeah. And malt is the ingredient for, for beer. So my job was to change barley into malt. And I'd done a lot on the basic physiology, how it, how it works. And one of my concepts was that the bran is the driving force of the enzymes that digest the grain to change it into malt. Yeah. Now, once I arrived, a lot of people thought that was crazy. Um, and then I had to try and change that now into technology. Yeah. Because so... it's point having this great concept, you know, but how can you make it work for the industry? Yeah, and so my, my understanding from, from the stuff that I've read was that the malting process at that point would have taken something around 10 to 14 days. Is that about right? That's right. I can say, it takes, say, 10 days. Yeah, um, and it, but it's because it started from one end of the grain and had yeah. to go all the way to the other end. That's right. From the germ end to the, to the, to the back of the grain, and that would take, you know, you, you, two days for soaking in water and about eight days for growing. Yeah. For the enzymes to be produced that digest, change the stuff into a very friable form, which you can then use for making beer, whiskey, or, or, or malt bread or biscuits. Yeah. 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 So the idea was an advancement of the process would be to make it go faster. Yeah. So instead of taking 10 days, it would take eight. Right. You know, so you're, 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 you're taking you know, two days off 10 every, every, every 10 days. So you're going to increase your production significantly. Yeah, and if it's, you're talking oh, about huge quantities of grain that are, that are being... Oh, oh, yeah, you're talking about industry is using over a million tonnes yeah. every year. So the question of processing that and speeding that up is obviously... It's, it's a difficult task. So what I did was that I got the concept of the brand and... And since the, and it's so simple that it, it, the brand goes around the grain, we know that the germs are that in. So the idea was, if the brand goes right around the grain, if I can stimulate the brand at the back of the grain, which normally takes ten days for the enzyme technically to get there, yeah, if I could start off that back end at the same time as the front end starts and meet in the middle. So it would be meeting in the middle in, a, in about, you know, with, with saving about two, two, three days. The question was, though, how am I going to trigger the back yeah. to start? 
And, and there was a hormone then called gibberellic acid, which is used to spray on fruit so it doesn't have seeds. So that's how you get seedless grapes. Right. They're treated with this. It's a natural hormone. The plant produces it. But if you put it on the plant, it suppresses seeds. And we had that um, hormone available then because it was being used anyway by the industry right. to, to speed it up but from one end. So all I needed was to find out how I could get that, that hormone, which is normally used, how can I get it in the back end? And that was what my boss said to me, you know, this is just nonsense. If that is the process, how are you going to get it in the back? Because it doesn't get in, the skin keeps it out. Anything you spread on the grain, the skin keeps it out. So what I then did, I just took a pin and stuck it in the back end of one grain one grain, and then put it processing with other grains. And I found it was digesting itself from both ends. So because I damaged the back, yeah. the, that was the, all the took. which triggers it could get in. So the, the, the idea then, how could I do 10 grams? Because that's one grain. Yeah. So I got a machine, it's called a perla. You know, we get pearl barley. Yeah. Mm. If you put barley in this machine and turn it, it will eventually take all the skin off. But what I did, I just did it for, instead of, say, 20 turns to take the skin off, I did it for one turn. So just I noticed, the skin. You just crack the skin across the back. So and then it, you, you, That's right. So if you only do it once, it, it then just scrapes the back. And that's exactly what I found. It... It, and it doesn't scrape the front because the front has a thicker cover of the skin, of the grain. The back, sometimes you look at it and it's exposed. The, the skin doesn't go over the back. So by just doing it one turn instead of 20, I found a process, now which they call abrasion, scarifying the back, and I found those 10 grams. Every grain in that started to, to, to process from the back as well as the front. Now, how can I go from 10 grams to make it work for the industry? Because they use thousands of tons. Yeah. And that was a problem. You know, I had to get from, oh, transform this little perla, which does 10 grams bigger. <laughs> and so when I say, yeah. pardon? And just to, to make it a big machine. Yeah, to make it a big machine. It up. Well, what I did, I took it to the workshop and I said to the guys, could you scale this up? And they said, yeah, we're just going to imitate it. So they just make it bigger. So they made yeah. a machine that was bigger. And we did 100 weight in an hour. So that was now pilot scale, so to speak. Yeah. But the principle, the science was correct. So and when the science is correct, I've got a thing in my book on cereals. It's called Technology is Science That Works. That's a strut line I wrote in there. Technology is science that works. So when anything doesn't work, the science is wrong. So when your car doesn't start, the science yeah. is wrong. And <laughs> therefore, you know, or when you don't feel too good, the science is wrong. And therefore, all my colleagues then were watching me and saying, now from a doubt, they're saying, could we take it from 100 weight to 10 tons an hour? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, <laughs> no, no, no problem, guys. No. Jump into the deep end. <laughs> I just give me uh, just give me five minutes. I'll get that sorted out for you. Back, back down to the edge. Back down to the engineers again. It's just like, guys, can we scale this machine up again? How much? Much, much, <laughs> much larger. <laughs> so what I did, I knew a company that made a machine which you put flour in, right? And, and, and you 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 spin the flour in this machine fast. And it kills the bugs. That's how you get bugs out of flour. Right. You take the flour, put it in a machine that spins in such a high revolution, the bugs get knocked against the wall and die. Right, okay. And, and, so and, so and, like and, like vermin, like mites and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah, the mites, yeah. Yeah. So anyway, I went to see this company in Manchester. It's called Simons. And they got this big machine, and I said, you know, could you slow it down? <laughs> And, you know, it has an abrasive surface. Could you just slow the speed down and then whatever? And they did. And eventually, cutting a long story short, 
that machine, we adjusted it, and it did 10 tons and up. That was enough. For it was a big drum, big circular drum, like a big pair. Um, and uh, and then the, went into production. And eventually, people like Bass Charrington's, they had eight machines. You know, one of the biggest breweries in the world, they had eight. I remember I went there and looked at it. They had eight allied breweries, Double Diamond or Skull. They had, God knows how many, they never told me. So by 19, and what this Truman's, they were using it. And by 1975, a significant amount of the, the brewing, the big brewers, well, we're using this machine. Of course, the monsters don't like it. No, because no, it's not, no. I mean, but, that's I, it that's by from them. but from a personal perspective, like that must have been a real sense of achievement for you, you know, to see all of this research actually come as something um, in front of you, you know, that's that's actually been used by the industry that's, uh, that, that's practically uh, made a massive difference. The industry must have been quite satisfying for you, was it? Yes, it was, in the sense that, you know, it was it was hard work because it was always being developed um, throughout this doubt. Yeah, right, okay, like so you're, you're always trying to prove your point. Yeah, you. because, yeah, you're doing something new and people don't always like that. So it, it was tough in that my boss, and it's on the life scientific, my boss, you know, was doubting it and was threatening me in a way you know, it's like, it better work what you're doing, you know? If it doesn't, and I, my, I had to take a job. Yeah. Because had I failed, then it probably got rid of me. But you, um, had, the, but you had the belief in what you were doing. I, I had a belief in it, um, and I came in Saturdays, um, and, and, and I always therefore believe that science, you know, there is no, there is no colour to science or race or, or whatever. A two is a two. And yeah. it doesn't matter who's telling you it. <laughs> yeah, so if, if 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 a guy is, is white and he's telling you three when you need two, <laughs> then you've got to take the black guy if he's telling you two or you're going to be an idiot. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's the thing as well. A name or a paper and stuff, a name or a paper and stuff doesn't necessarily reflect who the person is. So like the piece of the science... Like the fact that your paper is published with the science that backs it up there at the other side of it, like that's not a white guy or a black guy or anything. That's just a guy whose name is on Absolutely. the paper. You know what I mean? like, uh, that's the, what, the beauty of science. That So, for example, when um, I did that, and then I also, it's something I don't talk about much, but I also, did, you know, when you got the scanning electron microscope came out, I... I took some barley and I was the first person in the world to have a look at cereals using the scanning electron microscope. And that gave us an idea. I remember the, and the chairman of, of Scottish Brewers came down to the Research Institute and I showed him a picture of the inside of barley and I showed him the inside of malt, how the enzyme had digested it. And he laughed and he said, Jeffrey, I've been told about barley and malt all my life and I never understood a word of it. <laughs> but, <laughs> but now I can see it. it. Yeah. You can see it. And that transformed the industry in terms of uh, they had a visual thing now, and the chairman to the um the cleaner could could see the difference between barley and malt. They could see if you have barley, you have two kinds of starch granules, big ones and small ones. And if you look at malt, all the small ones are gone. During the malting process, the small ones go. And if the small ones are there in the malt and didn't digest properly, then the brewing can slow down. That's how critical it is. Right. And so we, we, we my, my, my micro, the microscopic work and the operation work then gave me a sense of security. And that, when I say that to people, it's very important because in many black people, they talk about, you know, leaving their jobs because of all the prejudice and all this sort of stuff, and the figures are quite high. But what I found was when I was doing mine, once I'd done these things and they become, became well-known and established, then I had a security. 
that my boss really would have to have a hell of a story to get rid of me. Yeah. Because the chairman of Bass would say, where's Jeff? Because he's... he's using my process. Yeah. You see? And, and thus, that's one thing which I can say to people. And this applies to everybody. And when I wrote my, my book called The Enlightenment, I used the term in it is system consciousness. And that's how I describe how I've managed to survive. It's, it, it, it's, it's knowing what is expected within the system. You don't have to comply. Yeah, but you, but have, to, you have to make it work for you. In a absolutely. My brother did. And, you know, he died early. We're from the same you know, part of London and stuff. But he figured he knew what the system was. And, it, and I told him it, it, it'll kill you. And he did. So... The fact is that I'm now okay, and I'm at the Research Institute, and in 1977, and I'm a cloud, my old supervisor retired, and the university came to me at the Research Institute and said, we're going to advertise her job, do you want to apply? And I did, and I applied, and I got it. But I, I didn't get the job as professor, I got it as... Electra. So I came to the Harriet Watt in 1977, back to where I did my PhD, where I left in 68 as a lecturer at, in Chamber Street at the whole Harriet Watt. And that's where I started my lecturing career. Yeah. And what did you didn't get the role as professor. Like, what was the reason? Well, what, what, well, what, what happened was. I, 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 as I said, I started as a lecturer, so I had to then work my way to the professor right. position. So I started in 77, and I became professor in about 89 or something, I can't remember. But I then had to do more research, so I got my Doctor of Science, which is the highest like, science degree you can get, where you, pop, where you submit all your publications, and those are assessed. And I, I did that, in, I got that 85. And then by 89, I was made a professor. I then I traveled to Japan and different parts of the world. Then even met my father again in New York in 1975. And so what, what were you involved in in Japan? Was it to do, I know that Japan can uh, really took on the mantle of, of, of kind of making whiskey in the same manner oh, yeah. as, as they do in Scotland. So was it in relation to that? Yeah, it was, yeah. And, and, and you see, we train a lot of the Japanese distillers, you see, and uh, um, they wanted me to come over Santori. Right. And because of my research reputation, now, <clears throat> they wanted me to come and talk and, and, and talk about research and see how I could you know, motivate and to give them ideas. So I went, and that was good. I did about a month there and did some research on Saki. Okay. Um, you, say, you say research job, uh, so Jeff, is that, do, you, do you mean research or were you just, were you just drinking a lot of it? Well, <laughs> no, it was actually, I drank <laughs> a lot. But, but, but I drank a lot of it, but it was looking at, the irony is they, they say, what did I want to work on? And uh, uh, they thought I was gonna, I was gonna say barley, but I'm probably said, quite sick of barley at that stage. That's right. I, I, I said I'll work on sake, yeah, and, and that's what I did. And we um, uh, published. We got a lovely little book on my research, and then the, the probably the most significant, um, one of the most significant is when Guinness asked me to go to Nigeria for them, right? Because the, the government had banned European grain into Nigeria. Right, okay. And, um, and it, Guinness is, like, Guinness Stout is extremely yeah, so, popular in Nigeria, well, isn't it? Oh, yeah. That's, what, that's, that's what I was just going to say. Like, I just found this out. Like, I, I've, like, weirdly, I only found this out this week. Like, I did not know that there was, like, essentially, Nigerian Guinness as a standalone product, essentially, oh, almost like, from... from Irish Guinness, you know what I mean? Like, as its, yeah. own, as its own following. Oh, oh yeah. It is. Well, the Guinness in, in Nigeria is, the, the brewers in Dublin drink the 
Nigerian. Yeah, like my, my cousins, my cousins are Nigerian. My uncle's ni- my Nigerian as well. So yeah, like I knew that it's a it's a really big thing out there. Oh, it's a big thing. It's Guinness has four breweries there. Yeah, and 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 Heineken has five. So and and so what it was the Guinness says, could I go and have a look? Because they they didn't want to close the breweries. So I I went had a look and cut a long story short we 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 a strategy was devised to use the local grain sorghum you know and it was wonderful because you know when I left Nigeria the local brewer says LRM local raw material so he had a local raw material making an international product yeah and that gave him a great sense of pride yeah and, and that motivated the staff. So once I did that, you know, I helped then do it on my own. Um, I then, you know, came back to university and I was working there anyway. And I helped Shibas Regal to set up a civil regal academy, which again was bringing people to Scotland from all over the world and then setting up a course so they had a better knowledge and understanding. Of, yeah, I, of, I, understand, of I, understand, I understand you've, you know, a lot of the kind of craft brewers and stuff that that have yep. popped up in Scotland over the past kind of what ten years, I suppose. A are, lot. Are, 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 are people? Are my students? Yeah, your, your ex pupils. <laughs> yeah, so you must get yeah, Stuart, from that Stuart, too. Stuart. I don't want to call names now, or they'll they'll get upset if I leave them out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a lot, a lot of them, a lot of them. So a lot of them are my are my students. And at, at the same time as all of this has been happening, you've also been working incredibly hard. But you, you're currently the honorary president of Elric, which is the yeah. That's right. yeah so it's and, the, and the person was ringing me repeatedly was the chair. All right, okay. <laughs> and, so we're keeping you from your good work. Well, but and he's um, you know we, I get on very well with the 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 Asian community because they they are. Uh, uh, um, they, they, they are, you know, they're responsible for keeping Alric going. Right. Um, ever since I've been here, and uh, and so I'm, I, I'm, I'm, the irony is, there's the Edinburgh Mella, which people think is Asian. Well, I'm the chair. <laughs> <laughs> so I have that sort of, and I'm so I'm proud of it and, and appreciate it. That I, I mix with the communities, and therefore, whether it's African or Asian or, or um, you know, from Europe, I, I I do that. I have no reservations in terms of human beings. So, I I feel that diversity is is critical and inclusion. And you know, we're we're different, but the same. I always say that. Yeah. And and, and you know, we're one humanity, and I always say nothing else. That's the the bottom line. So. I, I have that relationship now within the community, but I do other thing. You know, I'm on the board of Citizen Advice Bureau, or I know I know the housing, which is for old people, and I help a justice. There's a justice society in in in, in West Lothian, and we've just set that up. And already the Scottish government is linking up with that organisation, and um, it's to ensure. There is a better diversity within our our institutions, and you know the the we want to stop the kind of thing where you know as I said I went for that to give that lecture and the woman thought you know um, I wasn't Sir Jeff Palmer, or I went to, to to the other into another place where the guy thought I was the bossy chauffeur. So um, we 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 we're still where. Black people don't have the representation. Yeah, we still don't have representation. We still have a long way to go. And we and have a long way to go, but you know, my attitude is that that death of that, that young man in America, I wouldn't be speaking to you if that didn't happen. Yeah. Well well exactly. And I mean I think the it's it's not perceived as big an issue like by the British public. The British public certainly like, like in America, it's whether no, no matter where you stand on what you think is happening, no one will argue the fact that there is definitely a much larger 
uh, race issue at the forefront of American culture, like all the time, like as in it's been spoke about. Music's lent itself to it. Popular culture has lent itself to it. Black exploitation movies has lent themselves to it. And that type of thing has existed. Whereas in the UK, over the last couple of weeks, we've even seen that you're, we're all coming up against the idea that like it's not as bad in the UK as it is in America. Uh, that's the, but that's that's the general consensus of a lot of people. Like a lot of people will tell you how this is an American problem that we're talking about, and it's not something that exists in the UK. Whereas I mean, other than everything that you've told us about the various things that you've come up against, you are more than aware that that's not the case. Yeah. No, I think it's, it's, it, I always say, you know, you should not compare situations. You know, each one should be treated separately. Yeah. Because I, I, once I you start to compare, then you find a, 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 ju- a reason or justification for not doing anything. Yeah. Um, so, I know black people like that, but I think we should look at our own situation and see where it is wanting. And I, I, I feel that we've inherited a lot of our, our past history culturally. Yeah. And culture is inherited just like genes. And somehow I was just thinking today, you know, I was driving right the road and I thought when I came, to, to Edinburgh, one of my one of my ex bosses, who you know, um, uh, and and he used to sit in the staff meeting, and he would say, and I'm saying it to you for the first time because I've not thought of it to, to today, you know, I forgot, I forgot it, and he used to say quite casually while we we're discussing something, he would say the nigger in the woodpile, yeah, and that was seventy seven. Well, I mean, I mean, but you, you had you had, a, you, had a, you had a Conservative member of Parliament um, say it in, in in Westminster, like what two or three years ago. I had yeah. actually never, I had actually never heard of that phrase until <laughs> it got such it got it got such a you know a media furore about the fact that she said it. But you know, I think that was very revealing because that's obviously a phrase that she feels entirely comfortable saying in her yeah. own. Uh, environment, you know, whether but, friends or family. But, but it's also linked to our culture. Yeah. In, in that, it, it, it's it's an English culture. It's either American or English. And that's direct from our slavery. Yeah. You know, so we've got a phrase which we've been using. So therefore, you can't say we have no knowledge of it because yeah. it has come down with our culture. Um, and and, and and it means you know the the difference the thing that is very different that yeah. is affecting the whole. And the other phrase was I just thought of it today when I came to Scotland. It was um, you know coming up the Clyde in a banana boat. Right. So yeah. this this is a phrase that I heard growing up that you I know, had yeah. no so, I had that I had no reference point for. Like I mean, it's yeah. like, it didn't mean it like the actual. I had heard the sentence be said. But I had never actually stopped for two seconds and thought, "What does this sentence mean?" Me. In the last, yeah, yeah, yeah. In, but in the last couple of years, obviously, reflection and getting older, and sharing what you're going to well, say about. Well, it. I was, I was just going to say, like Paul, Paul and I are cousins, which you obviously wouldn't know, Jeff. But but our, <laughs> our, our grandmother used to say this. Like I remember very clearly my grandmother yeah. saying that phrase yeah. growing up. It was just <laughs> totally normal, and yeah, it wasn't until I was, you know. Uh, in my late teens, that I actually sort of twigged this to hold, hold, hold on a moment. That's not, that seems that's not okay. That's, that's not <laughs> something that's all right to say, you know. But, yeah. yeah, but but, it, but it's so important because it, it is about, it, it is linked to the history. Yeah. It, 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 you know, of, of, so we're looking back at, at our history, you know, whereby, you know, we, we, we can't change the past, thank, thankfully. Um, but we can change the consequences. Yeah, and, and, and I, therefore, I, I mean, we can we can change the the lens in which we view the past through. Also, you know, because I think I think something that um, Scotland in particular has been quite guilty of is kind of distancing ourselves from. Yes, it's, um, it's sort of, we call it amnesia. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But like you know, it wasn't. We didn't really do that. That was that was the bad English. It, it, it wasn't us. Yeah. My friend used to say, "It wasn't no. us." 
<laughs> but that's but the, the problem is that historically, like if if you actually look back at a lot of what the empire done in India and in Africa and the plantations, there are lots and lots of Scottish names and Scottish engineers and Scottish leaders oh, of the military. And like I mean, like because hist- pretty much through the entire like the last few hundred years of Scottish history engineering and stuff has been a driving factor of it and so like naval engineers and stuff like like these were all scottish these, these were all scottish guys who done very well out of those roles and subsequently went on to do very well out of plantations and slave trade and then got a lot of money and got a lot of respect in their community and all of that type of stuff but it's something that is like it's weirdly because it's ignored by scottish people that they've done all those bad things but Scottish but, people... But, you know, I, I think our education system is at fault. Yes. And, and I don't know who was responsible for that, in that the educational system was sort of, um, you know, um, sanitised yeah. um, the, the curriculum. And, you know, and, and I talked to somebody earlier in the week and they were saying they didn't want to teach this because it might give the, the kids guilt. You know, and, and I say it's just nonsense. Kids are very resilient. Yeah. And if you as tell you, them as you truth, yourself, definitely no. That's right. And therefore, what we have is, you know, as I say, we've inherited this this culture, and we look at it very carefully. We can see it in the street names. We can see it in our jokes. We can see it in our uh, the you know how we how, how how we treat people. We can see it in our phrases like up the Clyde in a banana boat. And, and we can see it in nigger in the wood pile. And we can see, I looked at James Joyce and he used the word Sambo. And yeah. so, you know what I mean? So all these little things tell us that we are, we've got historical connection. And what you said about the surname, it was I who got the Jamaica telephone directory in 2007, because somehow I felt there's too many, too many coincidences with names and all that. So I looked at the Jamaica telephone directory and found that 67% of the name in it are Scottish surname. Yeah. Yeah, that's yeah, I remember reading about that actually in, in the newspaper. So you know, it, it is people who went to Jamaica and stayed there and whether whether it's the like Monroe district I was born, and my cousin is, you know, what's his name again? Gladstone Wood. A couple of Scottish names, yeah. Um, and my mother is Lamond, my mother's surname, yeah. So we, we Scotland has a tremendous link, and it's somehow you know I did a video for the Scottish government called "We Are Scotland," and you know again in that I was trying to to say well you know I've got this Jamaica birth, but I've got Scottish genes, so you know I've got that. Three five percent, and they call it was described as Viking. So you're looking at a Viking, <laughs> <laughs> Viking from Shetland. I didn't recognize you without the hat. That's right, I took that off. <laughs> but yeah, but yeah, Jamaica, Jamaica, they, they have this at Andrew's Cross as well, don't they? And the flag and yeah. stuff, too. They reckon that was like a potentially brought over from Scotland at some point. Oh, yes, there was a minister of the church who designed the flag for the prime minister. And he just used the Scottish flag and changed the colours. <laughs> <laughs> lazy, lazy design. <laughs> that's right. So, so you know, so that's how in, that came up. In terms of, you know, the, the current uh, debate, which is happening around kind of statues and potentially... You know, rebadging it and plaquing. I know that you've personally been involved for quite a number of years um, around the, the Dundas statue in Edinburgh yeah. and, and and try to try to put some extra information at least on that. But there's obviously, you know, we've we've seen in, in Brighton in the past couple of weeks statues being pulled down and thrown into Bristol. the sea. Bristol, Bristol sorry, yeah. you're right. Bristol. Yeah. Um, you know, so so where where do you personally stand? You know, what do you think is is the correct thing to do in this situation? What do you think is is the thing that will allow us to move forward in the in the best manner? How how do we go about go about educating people who obviously have, have missed that? 
within their, their school education? Well, you know, I think um, the Bristol situation sort of bothers me because I said to a paper the other day, you know, I said, if black people had taken that statue down last year, they'd be in prison. Yeah. Okay, and it's now because we've got white people and black people taking it down. And with the death in America and all that, the police actually said they let it go. Yeah. So we have that situation. Now, what has happened is that this has escalated to what I call the far right, who started to, you know, say statues got to come down. And some black people have actually welcomed that. And because they want the statues down, they were never going to get the opportunity to themselves. And I don't subscribe to that. I don't want any white activist to take anything down from me. Yeah. And I've said in the press, if my ancestors can face a white slave owner, I can face a piece of metal. And I want them kept up. Yeah. I want them to have the narrative on that statue as to what these persons, persons did. Yeah. Because I feel that's a way of educating the public. And, uh, and, and one of the things that convinces me that's right, you know, I work with the Dundas, done a lot of work with the Dundas statue and, and the plaque. Yeah. And, and that was... You know, we didn't get anywhere for about three years. And then this death, public reaction, people reading what I've written on that, that asked me what they could do. And I said, write to the council. Yeah. And they did. And, and give the council its credit after three years of delay. It, it, you know, the new, um, the, the leader of the council picked it up, had a meeting. And within five days, we've got a narrative, new narrative. But as the and, as the the, the and plaque slavery is on the plaque. Going to go ahead. Well, so, well, slavery is in the narrative for the yeah. first time since that statue was installed. Yeah, it was never on the on any plaques. So that's the achievement. At the moment, it is the the the, the draft is there and it's going through the council process. Yeah, you know they're probably going to go to committees and whatever, whatever. So that's where we are with that at the moment. But okay. um, my view is is clear. I don't want statues down, and I've often said we've taken two statues down. The third must be racism. We've taken two statues down. The third statue to come down must be racism. I don't want another piece of metal or or, or marble. And I think that, you know, we we need to address that issue. So that's, I don't want any more statues down, and I want a plaque on the statue. And we may be the first in Scotland to actually address that situation with the Dundas yeah. statue. And Dundas is such a significant figure and, in and slavery. Think... You know, then I think that would be real a real achievement to 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 get that plaque up. Do you think that we should be like in Glasgow for the, and I know that Edinburgh is the same, we're, we're closer to Glasgow where we are. Um, yes. I, I, I lived in Edinburgh for six years. We have an, a number of very prominent streets named after uh, slavers and plantation owners, etc. So would you be in favor of being those renamed or plaqued or, you know, just a, a, a little bit of information, as you say, giving a narrative to explain how these streets came to be named. Um, I, I, you're absolutely right. I would, you know, we'd have to, you know, how are we going to take stuff down? Because I think it'd be hypocritical to take down statues and not the gallery of modern art. Yeah. Well, that's, that's, I mean, that's, that's, they, a, that's a slave owner's home. That's a slave owner's home. Yeah. You'd have to take down, the, take down the necropolis. Yeah. Because it was a slave owner, Ewey, who built it. And you got to take down the merchant's house. 
and a part of the, the Trace, Trace House. That's and cool. all street names and all this kind of stuff. So it's, it's, it's nonsense. It's not possible. I suppose the other real danger is it also creates an easy out, like a, a quick fix. So instead of actually focusing on education, instead of actually focusing on oh, yeah. making people understand where these, where, where these people got their money from, instead it's just if we take the statues down, then we're fixing the problem because we're showing that we're fixing the problem, but you're not actually fixing any problem in the grand scheme of things. Yeah, yeah. and, and, you're, and you're almost taking the conversation away as well because oh. in 10 or 20 years' time, those statues won't be there for like, the next generation to learn yeah. how they got there and how they made their money. And that's why I say, if you take away the evidence, you remove the deed. Yeah. And, and therefore, that's why I want the, the statues or the, to, to remain. And um, I don't want, you know, part of our heritage to be removed um, because that helps us, it's part of our, culture and it's part of my identity and, and i don't I, I don't want somebody going to bannockburn and painting you know robert the bruce because you would then get somebody in scotland hating black people for starting in bristol and and that's the sort of what i call you know um backlash yeah and the idea is you're quite right if, if if you've got a race problem we'll just take another statue down for you yeah, it becomes yeah, a, 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 a completely shallow motion. Like it's just like we oh, oh black people are annoyed again. Let's take down a racist statue rather than Absolutely. changing anything. Yeah. So, so that's my position about that. We need we need information to inform the public. And I don't want them to be moved into museums either. Because a statue has a is it has a context. Yeah, it'd be a pretty shitty museum as well. Let's be honest. Like, let's, go and, let's go. And, let's go and see. Let's go and see all the like the museum of slavers or something. Yeah, yeah. Like, who's, who's going to go? And, who's going to go yeah. and see that? And, and it's just that you know they were somewhere else. Yeah, yeah. And, and I mean the other thing you is, know, and it doesn't look right. There is always a very real danger that if you create an area and a museum that is just dedicated to statues of slave owners and people who had racist agendas, you're just creating a shrine for racists to go to and see all their big hits in one right. place. Do you know what I mean? No, like, but even if they were to separate them yeah. and, and say, okay, then that'd be okay, you only have one. No, I think they should stay where the people put it for that reason 100 years ago. But just given their context... Yeah, you're you're losing the context of that history of that statue. So no, but, I don't. but also give them their context by making sure that the narrative of of their life is kind of accurately displayed and a bit more accuracy given to the good and the bad, if you will. Absolutely, and yeah. and you know and and you know people sometimes say to me, "It's the past," but the past has consequences. And it has a license for us all. Yeah. yeah, one of the consequences of the past is racism. Yeah. So my and, only, uh, we try and sort that. My only concern with the whole statue conversation is that for a lot of the for a lot of the public, the statues existed, but nobody knew really anything about the statues. Like essentially, there is this massive gap in education that there has to be. A, yeah. I mean, you and Jerry have actually back and forward like different ideas about how you could actually address it because it's it's only it's only something that we can put in place until whoever whatever government, as Jerry pointed out, spoke about it, whatever government at the time decided they don't want to be teaching it anymore, then it's taken out the curriculum. But there's definitely this gap of knowledge, eh, especially in young people, where something has to dramatically change about the way that we're yeah. doing it because the only way we can get. The only way we can do that is is, is 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 get rid of racism, and that's not going to happen tomorrow. And it's, it's a very sad situation that we're still talking about something which human can't invented. They made it up. Yeah, and and like like you mentioned earlier, that obviously the kind of the media attention that has happened and the public pressure. You know, people have asked you, "What can we do?" So you've you've asked them to write to the council. That has made seems to have made a little bit of a difference that public pressure. And we've kind of seen that today. I don't know if you've been following the news where, where Marcus Rashford has, has essentially pressured the UK government into providing yeah. 
Um, so, yeah. School. Uh, again, you know, uh, it's, we're on this crest of a wave of, you know, which is based on this side death of this young man. And thus, I feel now, we try and get, you know, if you can pressure people, because, if you know, I've got emails now to, from various institutions in Scotland asking me, you know, what they're going to do and what they, you know, they should or shouldn't do. Whereas six months ago, I have heard from any of them. Yeah. So again, that it's the, the sad thing, it's the realization by looking at that killing. Yeah. Uh, that, you know, it is that that has done it. It's, do you know what it is? And it's very sad. It is a crucifixion. Yeah, I mean, it has triggered this response. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, uh, you're 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 absolutely right. It's um it's something, and, and I suppose the especially in America, there has been a real bubbling of of racial tension because of who the president is, because of um a, a lot of the divisions that have been going on in yeah. American society. Because and, and they've left, and they've left the they've left race to the law. Yeah. Uh, and, and therefore, race is, 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 if you leave it to the law, it then becomes, a, there's a criminal entity to it. Yeah. And, and yeah. therefore, that was what I saw in Edinburgh when I came in, in 77. And what we tried, we worked with the police to try and, 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 and move it away from the police. So race is now spoken about in schools, universities, but it wasn't in, in the 60s. Race was about the police, and in America, we've got to move it away from the police. Well, that, I mean, historically, a lot of laws, or a whole pile of laws, were created in America with the subtext that they were designed to keep races in check. So essentially, Mexicans and black people were being subjugated with laws that were designed specifically to attack them, but without saying on paper, these are racist laws. They were just designed right. to target certain communities. It's, uh, and those yeah. laws, are, in a lot of cases, still exist in place. That's why you have such a high number of uh, black men in prison in the United States, for example, yeah. and in the UK as well. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, yeah, we've got a high population here as well. But I, I just think that what we now need to do is to remove some of the, what we call the racist concepts, you know, um, and, 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 and we've got to get things like, get rid of things like unconscious bias. You know, the fact is that we had racism and we thought that doesn't sound too good, so let's invent a fudge. And that's unconscious bias, you know, or, or, or the Windrush thing has produced what? Institutional ignorance rather than institutional Racism. Yeah. So we, 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 we go from a situation where we're, we're stating and confronting a truth. And then because we can't solve it or don't want to solve it, we invent a terminology to actually moderate it. An unconscious bias and, 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 and institutional ignorance are two of those terms, which we should get rid of them. It's also a very strange phenomenon because a lot of racism is based on, well, pseudoscience. You know what I mean, essentially, it was based on a lot of like non understanding of humans, essentially, non understanding genetics, non understanding of like essentially a whole pile of sciences in the background. And for some strange reason across like the UK or across the world, we've managed to shift away from loads of the garbage pseudoscience that we had for lots of things, but we still. There's still some part of the still race is still attached to parts of these. Well, you know, we, we haven't got rid of the pseudoscience. We, in the sixties, we had a, a guy called Isaac, and he was doing IQ tests on black people. Mm -hmm. And then Watson, the DNA guy, you know, is saying it two years ago. So you know, we still have, you know, IQ tests which are Eurocentric and don't apply. And somebody yeah. said, well, what do you mean? And I said, you need a control. And they said, what do you mean? And I said, a controlled white person for a black person in an IQ test 
is a white person that has been through slavery. Yeah. And has lived subsequently like black people. That's the control. Yes, that's actually a control that is actually unachievable in the West for the most part. I mean, in the grand scheme of things, it's very difficult to find a group of white people who were subjugated to slavery and then not, have... Not you, know, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't find you wouldn't find any. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You see what I'm, I'm talking about? Then you'd have to take them back 200 years ago, get... Um, so, you know, you've got white people there and black people would have to get a boat and take them somewhere in the Caribbean and enslave them for 200 and odd years, let them come now through the wind rush and then Give them the test. It's a ridiculous notion because it'll never happen. It's not as bad as it's, 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 it's a tough you test. It's a tough test. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's impossible. You're giving two people the same test, then you have to give two people the same test who have been through the same conditions to get a comparative result. Yeah. That's basic science. So if you're working on liver, then it's the same liver that is divided up around the world. So the guy working in Japan is working on the same liver itself. He's got a piece of it as the guy in New York. So when they get the results, they can compare them. If they're giving them different drugs or the same drugs, the trouble with human beings, you can't do that kind of experiment. Yeah, so and, you, and, you, and you can't, you can't um, isolate the individual from the culture no, and, and, and no. the effect of history on that culture. So those guys who were doing these IQ tests were trying to say these tests are valid scientifically and they're getting for a result for black people. And believe it or not, the COVID thing is the same. Yeah. Initially, because black people were dying at a higher rate, they had begun to say it was genetic. Yeah, well, it's not. It's, be it's because of it's the endemic... deprivation. Yeah. It's deprivation. Yeah. But yeah, it's, it's a class that, issue rather than a race issue with regards to Yeah, that. but somebody had said it was race in the beginning. A guy called David Green wrote an article in The Telegraph, I saw that, and he was talking about victimhood and, you know, it could be like sickle cell anemia. But that's why race is dangerous yeah. because when Kant and Hume did it, they just came to the conclusion, yeah, you know, they're blacks or they're inferior and whatever. And the slave owners took it and drove it. It justified what they were doing. And you've had, you know, you've had large sections of the mainstream media pushing narratives which dehumanize immigrants, really. Oh, yeah. In the past, in the past, well. Yeah, in the, um, in, and, and, you know, okay, we've got the black and white medicines and we've got all the... But what, where we are now is that we have a situation where if I could be treated in that way, you see what black people say, well, if you're gonna treat Jeff like that, what about us? We haven't made any progress. Yeah. I'm, I'm hopeful that, you know, the work which we did with Glasgow University, where they admitted they had slavery money and they set up reparative programs yeah. for black kids or black students. Now that's the way we got to go. Where yeah, and and you know, uh, if somebody like them found out they've got these links, and then they set up courses or training, and I helped to do that for the NHS in Edinburgh, where we found we only had four managers of of that kind, in and and we set up courses or the courses were set up, and I was involved. And at the end of the period, which is probably three, two, three years or whatever, um, we've got 28. Yeah, so it's it's all it, racism. It shows we've got to do that. If the opportunities are there, then, you know, people, people are smart enough and can apply yeah, themselves we've, well we've, enough to... We've got to get people ready. We've got to get people ready. Yeah. It's funny. It's funny you should say that because I mean our listeners are aware of this. But I had so I worked as a contractor in the NHS in Glasgow, and I worked in a room full of 
IT people who were on a relatively high-ish band. I mean, it was a big room full of people. And thinking back now, something that I hadn't thought about up until you've just mentioned it there, but I don't think there was many non-white people in that entire building, like, if any at all. Like, I was thinking, yeah, yeah, like, like just in, there's 40,000 members of staff or something in NHS Glasgow, and that was essentially their entire IT wing that's there. And I don't think there was, it might not be fair, I might actually be, there may have been one or two, but not enough. Yeah, that, but, but, you know, but you're right about the concept. I usually say to people, look around your office and see how much equality you've got or inclusion. Yeah. And I feel in a diverse society, you need diverse management to make it efficient. And thus, I'm also, what I'm doing is to explain the history so people get a better empathy for my position and other people's position. And also to, 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 to try and ensure that our society set up um, um, uh, you know, sort of um, things that are needed to 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 bring people within the system. So, so is, is, is there is there anything that you would recommend that our listeners could do in order to improve the current situation where, where they are in in the UK? We've got poor representation. The way to do it is is the way, as I say, the NHS did it that we recognized that there were not enough managers. And then what we did was the, 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 the organizers set up um, uh, courses, which in fact reflect the needs yeah. of, of, of the institution. And, th and then they, um, these courses train the people in order to understand the needs and to, uh, because they're highly qualified nurses, yeah. but it's to understand the needs of the system. And, you know, this doesn't apply to the NHS, whatever, but I'll give you an example that, you know, you have a situation where um, somebody was, you know, dressed uh, uh, inappropriately. Uh, for going to interviews, okay? And he was great, you know, computer operator, but never got promoted. Because he, he, he turns up to work, you know, in a in jeans when he, he shouldn't. And, and he's sort of jeans which are tatty. Yeah. Um, or he would turn up in a T-shirt when he's going for an interview because he said it's in the summer. Why have I got to wear a, a suit? And at least then, nobody could, could convince him. And I took him aside one day and I said, okay, um, you've got a five-year-old daughter and then you take her to the doctor and when you get there, the doctor's got his feet on the desk, you know, with a spare slippers. And he, he's got a T-shirt on says, you know, I hate patients. <laughs> uh, you know, and he's really smoking a cigarette and you've then got to leave your daughter with him because he's the doctor. Yeah. And did, you, that, did that message, can I... Said no. Yeah. And that, that got through to That's him. right. I also use another analogy. There's a guy who says he's a policeman and, and you want to leave your daughter with somebody just to do something. The guy says he's a policeman. Would you leave your daughter with him if he's dressed in a cut off jeans, wearing slippers, you know? Um, and, you know, look, sort of, doesn't hear it's not cold. And he said, no. And I said, you wouldn't do that if a guy came on a plane either, looking like any of those two guys and he's a pilot. And you get a chance to get off. Get off the <laughs> and he laughed. Yeah. And he said, Full, I understand. So I said, you've got to dress appropriately for a certain institution. Yeah. And if you're in those institutions, then that's what you've got to do. If you don't, you know, they'll fire you or they won't employ you. See, so it's my, it's my term, system consciousness. Yeah. It's critical. 
you know, you're 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 able, obviously, to perhaps put that concept in it and frame it in a manner that someone can understand it. Mm-hmm. You've you've worked for a, a large portion of your life lecturing and dealing with students and having to explain mm-hmm. concepts to them in ways that they understand. You know, for for the average person, that might be a little bit more difficult. Oh no, I don't. No, never, we, I never underestimate the public. You've just got if you if you told anybody what I just told you, they'll fully understand. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it is. It is when you have a course with you know overheads and powerpoints, and and you've got all the jargon. It, then it gets to look to, to nowhere. Yeah. All you've got to do is to find it's a meeting expectations and you've got to try and get that person to meet those expectations and, and therefore you've got to devise a course it, it's, a, it's a little hard work but you've got to devise a course which 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 explains all that and which meets it meets the needs of the of the people who will be taking the course oh yes oh yes and the results work we've gone from four to 28 so what people need are, are how we do instruct them to negotiate the system. And it's how you teach that, how you, you, you get that across to people. And that is, is, is critical and it works. Is, is system consciousness, how do you get people? For example, I'm in a car and I see a policeman behind me, I slow down. My brother sees a police behind him, he speeds up. Because he's defying the police. Yeah. Um, and, and therefore, if you're going to defy the law or defy, you know, one of your bosses who you then don't have the capacity to respond, then you're silly. It won't work. Yeah. And, and therefore, I'm just not cowardice or anything like that. All I'm saying is that just playing the game, right? Yeah, you, it is. It is okay. It, it, that sort of makes it sound dodgy, but no, no, it, but, but 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 you yeah. know, uh, it does like parameter it, say, it, say, uh, exactly understanding, uh, understanding just, the system. Term for it. Yeah, 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 absolutely. No, but it's it's, a term. That's what I'm saying. There's parameters that we've got to work within. Like, so we already know that, you know, if we want to change something politically or we want to change the way that education is put forward, we have to work within the parameters that already Absolutely. exist. Because, because changing those things is the priority. Changing the changing the uh, system that creates the parameters is a much bigger thing. Oh, it's, that, that, that's almost impossible to achieve in a short period of time. And realistically... Absolutely. So yeah. I wouldn't even, so, you know, that that's how we, we do it. And kids, for example, again, because I told these these, these black uh, um, um, PhD students, and I said, you know, you've got to develop a sense of belonging within everything you do. And they, they, they never thought of that. And, and that is critical for individuals to then become resilient. So it's not complicated. No, you it's not. Say, you could need a sense of belonging. What that means, you 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 are comfortable. You think, well, I'm Scottish. I'm not going anywhere. Um, I have my, my rights, and um, I, and I I I I'm, I'm, I'm associated with my little village or my town. My yeah, family. and I deserve to be here just as much as anybody That's else a, does. Absolutely, I deserve to be here is the exact sentence. It's like. Absolutely, and and but, once you've got that sense of belonging, then you can start to get people to turn their lives around, and that's what and that's what I I I, I did. But I I guess like so so you know we're talking about kind of two different things here because you've got you've got teaching people how to exist within the parameters of the culture that they live in, right? Which is essentially like turning up to play a game of Monopoly, right? Well, here's the rules of Monopoly. You have to throw the dice and, and go around the yeah. board and everyone takes their turn. That's the rules. Right. That's how you play. Stick That's within fun. those parameters and you can succeed at that. But how do we change in a broader sense? How can we adjust how that game works for everybody? How can we and how can we try and make sure that people 
um, within the culture of Scotland or within the culture of the UK, treat people more fairly, you know, um, understand the implications of our cultural history. How, how what's the best way to go about that? Is it just is it education? Is is that the is that the way to deal with it? Uh, yeah, of course you've got to 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 to. I say it's got to go in the curriculum. Yeah, and not in the nice to do curriculum. Right, well, it has to be a set like a core. Like it's math and English. Core subject. Yes, math, math and English. And yeah, yeah, math, English, and that, that's right. And I think because a lot of people don't teach that because they think it is, you know, it, it gives it may give the kids guilt, and therefore they've made that decision. But it's got to become a core subject. It's got to be examinable. You know, you, you take your exams in it like maths. And um, you've got to have qualified teachers. they got to know the subject well, because if you do these things and it's nice to do, then, you, you know, you, that means you get some unqualified teacher who just passes time with them. Yeah. So it's got to be a curriculum subject and, 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 and it's got to be examinable and it's got to be used for university entrance. So it must be a, se a second class citizen subject. So one, you, you can have courses, which are directed at the issue. And the other one is that, you know, you have courses. And the other one is teaching people um, how to be system conscious. You know, so yeah, they're, they're like, like... A two-pronged attack kind of thing. Abs absolutely. And education takes a long time. With kids in school, yeah. you know, we need to do something for the older generation. Now we're going to live another 30, 40 years. Um, but as what I said before, we've got to keep telling people we're different, but the same. We share the same humanity because some people don't think that. Somebody on the TV said to me, I can't remember when, um, you black people have got the, the qualifications. You've got the, the degrees, and I haven't got anything because I live in a council house. Although I'm white, I don't have anything. And I said to her, well, you, you, you're, more, you're less likely to get arrested than me. Yeah. You know, you're, 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 you're less likely to catch COVID than I do. And she hasn't thought of that. Therefore, her skin, despite the fact the the the, um, the the fact that she thinks she's missing out on so much, that is a built-in privilege. Yeah. From history. And, and and therefore, what we've got to 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 have is that, you know, um, that the privilege will be widespread, and nobody's going to get arrested more than the other. But without you doing anything, without you, you know, you've got people have to have privilege. I mean, yeah. oh, they haven't oh, armed in any way. No. And the other one as well is, is I met a tram in 1960. Maybe they, that's not the word they use now, they were begging. And um, in the grass market, and I, the guy said, give me, give me something. And I gave him, I think it was like, you know, two pound or a pound. And he said, it's not enough. And I thought, it's not enough. I said, I'll give you another pound if you tell me why you say that. And he said, well, he said, I'm better than you. And I said, how do you make that out? And he said, well, I'm related to... Robert Burns, Nelson, you know, um, and he named some other people. And I thought about it, I gave him the pound and I walked away. And just as I was going, he says, who, who the hell are you related to? You should, and you say, is, tell me you said Nelson and Robert Bruce, I understand <laughs> genetics, so, you know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Eric, the Eric the Red, fight for percent that's right, but that was his skin. It's the it's the skin related. Yeah. 
See, no, right. his skin gives him that link. Well, it's even the women. He, he then pushes prejudices. Yeah. Even, even and he's a women, beggar on the street. Yeah. yeah. The woman that you had spoke about, like when you had said how she said, you know, she's got nothing, but you've got your degrees or whatever. The very real scenario is that at her age in her life right now, if she was to start going through a process to get educated and someone from the black community was to do the same at the same time, when their paths crossed over at university level, that she's got a much more higher chance of being accepted into the university than the black person just because that's the way that things still play out in a lot of cases. Like, Oh, yeah. Yeah, so, I mean, so even her perceives, her perceiving that you have, you have got more than her, in actual terms, if, in, a, in a controlled situation, if Porton and went through a scenario, she would find herself much easier to get in different universities and schools than the black person who went through the same scenario at the same time. Absolutely. Uh, uh, but even... Whatever, it's just like she, as I, when she got the point, I says, you know, statistically, you're less likely to be arrested than me, mm-hmm. and therefore your skin is giving you some privilege. And did she? Do you feel like she took that on board? Oh yeah, fully, fully understood it. Oh, so you know, things like, you know, if you say these things to people, then you don't always have to make some great big social statement. No. It is to give them these little stories. And that's what people say they like in my Daily Mail article and stuff. I gave them some stories, but I then did statistics to say, yeah. you know, more black people are harmed or whatever. And I think that you've got to have that sort of a, well, you've got to use the word balance, I hate it. But somehow people got to be made to realize your skin gives you some privileges. Yeah. Which are probably not unjust or unfair, but they're there. Yeah. And uh, uh, and to pretend they're not is ridiculous. It is, is, to, to, yeah, to pretend they're not is, is, is naive. And, and it doesn't bode well for the future. I say each generation should do as much as it can not to pass on problems. Yeah. So to me, a good generation is one that has reduced its problems significantly. And, and therefore, with this particular situation, we've got to point out white privilege. We've got to then point out that, you know, black people are not from the planet Mars. Yeah. There, there was a reason for their enslavement. Yeah. There's a reason for them doing badly at IQ tests. Yeah. From and, what you I've said, you know. and you can't expect all of the damage that was done um, over quite a large amount of time to communities and and like cultural structures and stuff in Africa, bringing people over to the Caribbean, etc. You can't expect all of that to be undone. And I mean, no. there's, pe- there's people who, lots of people who were alive when the, the civil rights movement in America really ignited. You know, oh, like yeah. it, it's, it's in living memory that that blacks still had to be on the backs of buses in America. Oh, yeah. So how, how can we expect how can we expect everything to have sorted itself out by now and for yes. uh, but everything was, to have uh, out? What we can do, and I'm saying that these are little things that we can do, which everybody can do, not cost anything. And we can start, we've got to change attitudes. Um, and... Uh, uh, changing an attitude means better education yeah. because you know I, I'm arguing with, with, a, with a person on Twitter uh, because he, he said they're putting up all sorts of stuff about history and so to stop him I just had to say you know this is that building which he's associated with is a slave master's building and he was so shocked you know because he thought he knew about that building yeah the point is that we, for example, I went to the headquarters of the Bank of Scotland and I was giving a lecture to young lawyers. So this is the Bank of Scotland, the Royal Bank of Scotland. No, but I, that's, uh, is it not the last? Was it not? What, um, yeah, Lawrence Dundas's house. Yeah. So that's one of Dundas's relatives. Now, I start talking to this group of BAME lawyers and, 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 and whatever, financiers or whatever they call themselves. And before I started, I just said, 
I know some of you, you know, have got work related problems or issues of identity and whatever. But I said, this building is yours. <laughs> yeah. And there's some silence. <laughs> and I said, don't you understand what I'm saying? This building is yours. You don't have to feel any reservation. Yeah, it was it was built on Murray and from the labour of your ancestors. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, you know, and when it was over, a young man came up to me and he said, that's changed my life, because I never thought of it that way. So, you know, you look on Twitter, people have read my, what they call it, my, my articles, and like in the mail, and said it's changed the, the way they think. Because you don't have to do all that much. Yeah. What you've got to do is to identify people's needs and fulfill it. You've well, got to identify the needs first. I have to say, you're, you have a great attitude to, to not just this, but to life in general. Um, so, Jeff, like, really <laughs> um, a, a, charming, a charming individual, a very... Um, positive person to speak to and you know well I, I don't mean to bring up your age but you're 80 year old and you're a very yes, fresh, it, yeah. you're a yeah. very fresh 80 year old man <laughs> and you would you would you would definitely not you would definitely not think that um not a day over 60 a, not a day over 60 yeah, if you and like, I, not a I, day hope, over I hope that you can um keep that energy up and, and keep uh, thank you very much all these good causes because you're a real inspiration, man. It's been great talking and to you. Thank you. Thanks for talking to you. Good luck with the project. Yeah, thanks very much, thanks man. Very much. Uh, yeah, much. Keep in touch and, and yeah. I will nice wait, uh, as we say, used to say in London, I know where you live. <laughs> well, I know, I mean, <laughs> we can actually we'll get, we can get, we can get a beer in Edinburgh sometime. I, I imagine you know one or two good beers well, in Edinburgh. Like, yeah, like yeah, if, yeah, if well, you're the, you're the best person possible to go for a beer with. Yeah, <laughs> and the lockdown is over. Yes. yes. Okay, then take care. You, you too. Thank you very much. Thanks Thank a lot. you.